Well, thank you very much. I've been very, very happy to be with USGS for the last five years in Arizona. Um, but I work out of the National Headquarters Office. I'm duty stationed, they say, in Tucson, because I'm building a national network. And basically, it's a national early warning system to understand the effects of climate change on our natural ecological systems that we depend on so much. Some people argue that with our new cell phones and iPads and Androids, things which I don't know how to use very well myself, I'm, I'm getting so old for that, that we become sort of disconnected from nature and that we're, we have this nature deficit disorder. And I actually sometimes, I've just been realizing recently that, wow, I don't really think that's necessarily the case. Because in, in many ways, we're, we're really, in some ways, we're, we're certainly more connected, but we're more dependent upon na the natural ecological world than we ever really were. We've had, we had abundant systems that have been degraded for, for a variety of reasons, and it's now harder and harder to get water in certain places. And we had fires in Austin last year, and we had this weird spring, this weird, weird hot, hot winter and spring, um, and it affected all of us. It affected our lives, our everyday lives. And so the, the question is, what's going on on a national scale? We don't often take a national look. And let's think about the 30-year time frame, because we tend to have shifting baselines. Yeah, it was really early this spring, but is it really early? Was it early, early last year? Was it about the same? How about 2010? Uh, 2009, let's go back, way back. What is that trend? And so if we actually track and record patterns of temperature and the patterns of plants and animal activity through time on a national scale, we can start to get a pretty good idea of what those changes are and how we have already adapted and how we need to adapt into the future to maintain really our way of life. I mean, that's what we're all, we're all, we all want to maintain a way of life. We all want to maintain a sustainable planet, sustainable resources because we depend upon those for our own livelihood and that of our children. We want water. We want wildlife. We want working farms and ranches. And so that's why I'm inviting you today to get involved in this exciting new initiative, basically, again, building this national network where we're linking scientists and citizens together. Some people use the term citizen scientists for people who are volunteering, but in this case, it's scientists and citizens who are using the same tool, Nature's Notebook, and the same program to understand what's going on on a national scale and to be able to compare that information and to share that information uh, with each other to help us make decisions. So with that very long introduction, let me just uh, sort of get to the chase here real quickly in terms of an outline. I've got a lot of bullet points up here, um, but I'm only going to provide a few slides for each one of these, but I want to walk you through this. You've heard about this National Phenology Network, and that, my guess is that's probably a term that's new to, to many of you. You thought you were coming here to hear about altered seasons and you're hearing about phenology, which is, has a Greek root. So I'll talk about what is phenology, I'll give you a quick definition of that, and why, why it's important and how it affects our, our everyday lives. What are those trends that we're seeing out there across the landscape, historically and already? And really, what is the importance of that? What does that all really mean for us and for natural systems? And can we get organized to build a national network to start collecting this kind of information, to share this information and use it? Can we, uh, what are we finding so far? And I'm actually very, very pleased to be back here for my second uh, public talk. The first one was 2009, May 6th. I remember because it was my birthday, and I took a little celebratory walk out in the parking lot uh, before the lecture at that time. It was my birthday. And, and at that time, I'd been in the job for about 18 months, and I was talking about the National Phenology Network. And we'd, we'd been doing this, trying to build a national network for plants and animals and, and whatnot for 18 months. And, well, there was a lot of smoke and mirrors. Uh, back there uh, three years ago. We've come a long way, so I can talk about what we have been finding, and I'm going to invite you to join us in this project. So, got to start with the definition every time people tell me, oh, you need to change the name of your network. Okay, well, it's sort of given to us, so we'll, we'll just go with it. But every single time, again, I have to define what is phenology. No, it is not the study of the bumps on the head. It's an assessment of moral character at all. There is no R in phenology. It's not phenomen phenomenology. It's not friend of, uh, you know, uh, phonology, the study of sound. Uh, and instead, what it is, is much, much simpler than that. It's just the study of the timing of life cycle events of plants and animals. And when I say life cycle events, that too is complicated. But really, it's just things like migration. You know, when do the whales arrive? When do we manage to get out there to see them? What about reproduction? When is the best time to go see the wildflowers? 
or to go see the leaves change color, senescence is a fancy word for going into dormancy and, and leaf color change. And those are important decisions that we make and that nature is kind of constantly doing. Farmers make the same, uh, are very, very cued into this, if you will, and ranchers because they're depending on that natural system and changes. So I like to say farmers do phenology all the time. And why is phenology then important? And up in the upper left, upper right hand corner for you, uh, you'll be able to see that's the, that sort of keep track of the outline so you can sort of track the, the pulse of the, uh, of the talk, if you will. So why, why is phenology important? Well, first of all, phenology is really sensitive to environmental change or climate change. Animals respond very quickly and plants respond very quickly. Many of you experienced that this spring, right? Plants were coming up in your front yard earlier than you ever remembered. Or maybe, was it earlier than 2010? It was an early year then. Um, but very, very sensitive. Um, it, it affects critters, plants and animals, people and ecosystems. And ecological systems are those, those uh, natural systems and also human altered systems that give us things we need like clean air and clean water. And when the leaves come out on a tree, it starts sucking water out of the ground, it affects how much water is flowing through the stream, it makes it nice and cool, uh, puts that water in the atmosphere, and it affects the ecological system, takes up carbon. So that's phenology in action. And you're, you know, like, okay, you've, got a, you've suddenly learned a new term for something that you see and do every, every day. You see and do it every day. It's very easy to observe. And so since it's so sensitive and has so many downstream impacts, and it's happening everywhere, we can actually organize to collect information, and we call it a leading indicator. A little bit like an economic index, but it's leading, and I'll tell you why. Because when you think about plants and animals interacting out there in the natural world or in your backyard, there's different ways that they can respond to environmental driving variables, to change, to climate change. In this case, we are dealing with climate change. We're going to have to deal with it, and we need to understand what's going on so we can adapt to it. Well, species, meaning those kinds of plants and animals out there, and we are a species as well, we can do nothing. We don't have to respond to climate change. I'm speaking now about the, the plants and animals out there. Or we can adapt to it locally. We can do things like change our behavior. If it gets hot on, on, a, on a rock, well, we can just go over to the cool side of the rock. Um, or a lizard, say. Or we can change our, our, our phenology. What, when do we do certain things? When do we lay eggs? Or when are we mating or uh, with, with other animals, etc.? Or we can change the way we look. Morphology is a fancy term for how big or how small we, we get. Or we can change our genetics. There's little things that can change the genetic information in a, in a plant or an animal through time. Um, it's a passive response, not an active response. Uh, so when you can see I'm sort of scaling up here. Or you can change your distribution, move to a different location, move north like some butterflies are doing, or you can just drop, drop out and go locally extinct, or in some cases you might even go uh, extinct on a much broader, on a broader scale. So these driving variables, these environmental drivers that are pushing us, we, if we stand firm or we can flex with, with, those, with those changes in order to, to survive. So recognizing this, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in 2007, those 2,000 scientists that you've heard so much about uh, recently, unfortunately, got together and said, we're, we're scientists from across the, across the, around the entire world, and we are looking to understand what is the impact of climate change on natural systems, and they went and they said, what can we use to understand that? And they went and they found these great phenology data sets, especially in Europe in Korea where people have been tracking phenology for a thousand years and recording the information. Um, and they, they wrote in this, big, in this big document that phenology was perhaps the simplest process in which you could track the change in the ecology. The ecology is kind of like, where is it and what is it and what's it doing uh, of species in response to climate change. So they won the Nobel Prize for that, that document. And you've heard something about climate gate and some of those emails, etc. And I've actually been following that very, very closely. I'm not a climate change scientist, I'm a biologist. And I've been following that very, very closely. And as it turns out, there have actually been, there have actually been no situations where anybody did anything untoward. Yes, there were a few mistakes in the document itself, but it's really a very, very sound document. And we have 2,000 people working. Imagine a committee of 2,000 people trying to work together to get something done. They actually got something done, and it's actually quite fantastic. So. The question then becomes, well, what are the trends? And so I saw, I saw Bob actually on the, on the news um, last night and was wondering whether it's going to be warm today. But this is from the weather blog, it's from Watch Out Weather blog, and they were asking the, 
uh, last year, is spring arriving earlier in Washington, D.C.? You know, there's a lot of interest in that. There's a lot of money in that, if you know what I'm talking about. People coming to see the cherry blossoms around around the tidal basin. And I heard this spring, actually, people were clogging the sidewalks out there in downtown because it was just such a great, nice spring. And you could be out there on the sidewalks and the sidewalk cafes. And so people want to know what the trends are because they need to make decisions about what they're going to do every day. Well, we can go to science. We can say, okay, well, what are the trends? This is Camille Parmesan. She's a scientist at the University of uh, Texas in Austin, and she and Gary Yogi uh, got together a couple years ago, and I'll do this on all of these uh, slides that I'm talking about. There will be a, an attribution um, to a statement wherever I possibly can, and I'll be describing our project, and so if you want more information about it, you can go to the Nature paper, um, or you can come find me, and I can help you find that, that paper. They did an analysis of 677 species looking for long-term data sets where scientists have recorded over here or over there for this species or that species changes that they had seen in phenology. And they, when she put all those data together, they found that nearly two-thirds of the organisms that people had looked at and documented the changes had shown this change in the timing towards earlier springs. When it got warmer, plants and animals came out earlier. So they're putting together, cobbling together data sets showing this very, very, uh, very uh, cosmopolitan shift in the timing of plant and animal activity. So there's a lot of other sources of information too that are more recent or different kinds of information. I'd like to just kind of walk you through a few of those as we talk about some of these trends that we've been observing, um, either nationally or, or sometimes internationally. And this is uh, an article from the New York Times. It was an op-ed piece about uh, just about two weeks ago. Um, on, on early, early blooms and changes in phenology in Thoreau's Concord. So Henry David Thoreau, when he was out there at Walden Pond, was actually tracking the phenology of over 400 um, plant species. Many of them are actually no longer there in the Concord area for a variety of reasons, but, but many of them are still there, and people have gone, uh, people from universities have actually gone back, and found those organisms, looked at their phenology, doing the exact same thing that Thoreau did, 150 years ago, and for example, here's one example from the op chart that accompanied the New York Times piece for a high bush blueberry that the, the timing of the flowering has shifted about three weeks earlier over time. A lot of variation from year to year, but there's this earlier trend, this trend towards earlier flowering, just one of many species showing this change. Well, maybe you like butterflies. Art Shapiro sure likes butterflies. He's out at UC Davis, and he's been tracking butterfly emergence and flight for th over 30 years in the Central Valley um, as a professor. He has thousands and thousands of observations from thousands of sites and for hundreds and hundreds of species. And here are a few that are changing radically. The red admiral, the field skipper, when he's tracking those over the course of his 30-year time period, his 30-year study, he finds that on average, again, lots of variation from year to year, but on average, they're coming out about one day earlier per year. So over the 30-year time period, it turns out they're coming out on average a whole month earlier than they did when he first started his study. So this is just an example of one of the many types of organisms that are changing. Let's just let's go to the marine world. Uh, talk about loggerhead sea turtles off the off coast of Florida. This is some work done out of uh, central Florida. And uh, this is the day of nesting. Um, from early in the year to, to later in the year, from 1989 to about 2003, so about this 15-year time period. And there's, this, there's a lot of variation here, as I mentioned, from year to year, but when you use a regression analysis, a model to best fit those dots, you get a line that looks like this, and it shows that on average, it's nearly, again, it's nearly a day, a year, a day, um, was, uh, it was about a day, almost a day a year over this time period that sea turtles were doing their nesting, and they were attributing this to changes in sea surface temperatures that they were measuring. So lots of changes, lots of trends going on. But again, many lines of evidence. So this is an example of how we can use historical information that you wouldn't necessarily think would be useful. Um, and you've got it sitting down there in your basement, uh, for example, where we can look for changes in, in uh, phenology. And so these are paired photographs from Lowell Cemetery in Massachusetts. They were collected on the same day of the year, but this one was collected in 1868, and this one about 150 years later in 2005, and you can see it is exactly the, the same location there. And look at the differences in the canopy uh, of so, so long ago to what we see uh, this year. And in fact, you know, this year, it's such an early year in 2012, it'd be very interesting to see when the leaves actually came out. So there are these, these changes that are occurring. But 
You all know that things vary as you drive across the landscape. It doesn't have to be through time. They can vary spatially or uh, as you move from one place to another. And so this was an image collected by uh, MODIS. It's a MODIS image, um, which is a satellite imaging system that NASA has. And they, they put this image up on their, on their uh, website from April uh, 19th. This was an overpass, an image taken of our region. Um, including the Appalachians, here's Washington, D.C., here's the Piedmont down here. And you can see some interesting differences in the colors. This is basically uh, almost real color photograph image um, where you have uh, this area is all green, but then you can see the Appalachians, the uh, higher elevations are cooler and they hadn't leafed out yet. So you know that, you see that if you were to drive up from D.C. over to Front Royal, you would, you would see these, these changes at this time of year. And so you can actually look at the spatial variation of, of phenology, and you don't have to necessarily put it into a, a climate change or long-term context at all. But then you can mix them up, and you can think about, wow, things vary spatially over time. And this uh, beautiful figure is actually from uh, XYZ, uh, we call him Zhang, a uh, paper published in Geophysical Research Letters a few years ago, where he was looking at the change in the time of spring, again, using the remote sensing images like that last image I just showed you, where they detect the changes in the, in the colors, basically the greenness of the landscape. And what he's done is he's mapped that across the entire uh, continent of North America and showed uh, the scale here. This is earlier uh, in the year and, um, sorry, this is earlier in the year, the negative values mean earlier in the year and later in the year. And you can see there's a fair amount of spatial variation. This was again days, days change per year. And there's a very interesting trend that we're, we've seen here in the southeast United States that we're still trying to figure out. Um, the phenology of plants in the southeast United States is actually, in many cases, in, in whole forest systems, has actually become either not changed or become even a little bit later than the entire rest of the North American continent. And we think it's actually because of what just a paper just came out a few months ago about a big warming hole. We call it a warming hole. The whole continent of North America has warmed up over the last 30 years or so except for the southeastern U.S., and they think it has to do with large-scale patterns of atmospheric circulation and where those big trends in the jet stream sit and how much cool air they bring down. So we're still trying to figure that pattern out. That's partly what science is all about. You observe a pattern, then you try to figure out what is the mechanism that explains that pattern. So going back a little bit to some of Camille's work, what she found is something we actually know as scientists that different animals and plants respond differently. They respond individualistically, we call it, to a driving variable. If we increase the temperature here in the room, some of us are going to get uncomfortable and walk out of the room to the cooler foyer. Others of us are going to stay in here. We have a differential response. And you can lump that together into different types of organisms. And so this figure shows a synopsis of some of the work that she had done earlier where she said, well, let's look at the change in the spring timing and this is now in days per decade. Um, and let's just lump all organisms together. And what she found was on average about three days earlier for all those organisms, um, the, the change that we've never seen in days per decade. But there's a lot of variation. It depends on whether you're an amphibian or a bird or a butterfly. And we just lump them together. And you can see very interesting patterns of very different responses, which set stuff up. And I'll tell you about that in the next slide. So imagine if you're a butterfly, like a monarch, and you depend upon an herb, which is something like a milkweed. You know, butterflies love love milkweed. Um, there's a very there's been this shift in the timing of butterfly activity, but not much of a response for some of the plants like like milkweed. This is just an example, but it's actually a real life situation where we're worried about the timing and the mismatch of monarchs when they arrive and when the milkweeds are there and available for them. Let me give you one example that's actually very very well known and very well described. Some work done by Visser and Boff published in top-notch journals, where there's been a change in the phenology of some organisms and it's causing a downstream impact. And they've been looking at this very well-known system of English oak in southern England, a winter moth larva, this is the larva, just the caterpillar form uh, of, the, of the moth, and a flycatcher that migrates up from Africa and depends upon these moths. It doesn't really eat anything else, it just depends upon these moth larvae for its food substance. And what's been happening with warming conditions in the British Isles is that the English oaks are now coming out about two weeks earlier. Sort of typical of what we're seeing here in the U.S. too, where we have earlier phenology. Um, and the little winter moths, they're just coming out at the same time. They're being driven by the same driving variable. The warming conditions that are causing the leaves to come out earlier make the caterpillars come out earlier. 
But the flycatcher is getting different cues, and it continues to arrive at the same time each year. It's migrating a long distance, and it doesn't necessarily know that it's warmer in the British Isles. It doesn't have um, an iPhone uh, to be able to communicate back with the, with, the, with, the, with the grounds there. And so what's happened is because it doesn't have what we call resource substitution, it, can't, it doesn't eat other things, the populations have declined about 95% because of this mismatch of timing. So these things earlier, same time, and it creates a mismatch in the timing of organisms, which gets very, very important when we think about trying to preserve species like this on the landscape. Well, let me try to bring it home here a little bit, too, uh, in terms of what does this really mean for you. Well, you probably recognize this website. My guess is you probably maybe have gone here if you had visitors who came in for the Cherry Blossom Festival uh, this year. It's the centennial anniversary of those cherry blossoms around the tidal basin. Um, and we've been actually tracking phenology on those. The Park Service has been tracking phenology on, on those for, for a number of years. There's actually some very, very good information in the Washington, D.C. area. And this year, you, you recall that the Cherry Blossom Festival was actually quite long, celebrating the centennial. Let's have it for five whole weeks, a very long time period um, this year. And, uh, and they chose March 20th and April 27th, not just for five weeks, but also March 20th was sort of the earliest date the cherries had ever blossomed, and March 27th was pretty much the latest date the cherries had ever blossomed, so they can bracket that and make sure that there's cherry blossoms out there when there's hundreds of thousands of people, it seems like thousands of people anyway, who are all flocking around and visiting the cherry blossoms at the time basin. But unfortunately, peak bloom this year, it was a very early spring this year, and the peak bloom was on the very first day of the festival, which is great, except the first day of the festival is not when they have the opening ceremony. That's a little bit later in the week. So by the time they really got the festival rolling, the cherries were done. So this is an example, this is actually a very important example of a mismatch in phenology that has direct economic implications because you can imagine people are sitting out there in Milwaukee and they're thinking, should we go to D.C. this year or not? Land and reg and check it out, go for the Cherry Blossom Festival. Oh, let me check the webcam there, let's check the Park Service Bloom Watch. Ooh, this doesn't look too good. We're not going to be able to get there. Or, I already bought my tickets on Travelocity, I cannot change the time that I will go. I'll just go and partake in the other activities besides watching the blooms. So we need information. We need information, we need to understand those patterns and the reasons behind them, and we need to learn how to adapt. Like I talked about, farmers are doing phenology. They're constantly changing cultivars or planting dates or harvest dates in sync with the natural system as much as possible, or they go broke. They're managing their, their uh, old field mowing so they don't kill the baby birds. We're thinking about setting hunting seasons because we need to know when the, when the animals are there and what should the season be so we can time the season for when the animals need to be harvested. We're talking about pollen. A couple years ago, people were calling me up saying, what's this thing with the pollen bomb? Earlier leafing, earlier pollen, worse pollen. You had fires in Virginia a couple weeks ago. And so I think there's this knock-on effect that's happening where when you have a really early spring, it's going to affect things like fires and pollen and stream flow. We don't normally think about, but we depend on those ecosystems for services they give us, and that's being disrupted. I can go into some other examples uh, later on as we go along. Just want to keep track of the time so there's time for a question. So getting organized. Wow, that's a lot of stuff going out there. Take a breath. Well, that's where USGS comes in, and Park Service, and Fish and Wildlife Service, and Department of Energy, and a number of other collaborating organizations. And I actually will take this very moment just to say, I'm standing up here, I'm giving this talk, while I'm representing a network, and there are a lot of people who have helped get us to where we are today. Very proud, obviously. And, uh, and a lot of organizations and agencies who are pulling together a multi-agency collaboration, basically, to initiate this USANPN.org. It's an, a .org uh, organization that is supported by USGS and these other organizations. I'm a USGS employee. I'm an ecologist. Thank you very much for paying my salary. I appreciate it. And um, I just want to make sure that's, that's real clear. I, I, I do appreciate that and that I'm working for you to build this network, but there's a lot of other people, including the staff back in Tucson, who are helping build this thing as well. So when the network was originally conceived, actually in 2004, just not very long ago, and we actually opened up our doors in 2007, 
National Science Foundation provided resources to get the thing up and rolling, USGS, etc., all come together to build this new data resource, this national network of what we call integrated plants and animals together, phenological observations across space and time. And before you came in and heard this preamble, you probably wouldn't understood this, <laughs> this sentence. And, uh, but I hope that by, by, by giving you some introductions to what some of these terms mean, you'll have a better understanding, and I'm going to kind of lead you through this just a little bit more as, as we go forward. So who is the network? Basically, all these organi organizations and many more that I just mentioned, I'm having trouble keeping track of getting the logos up onto the screen. We have a long list of partners. If you go to our website, you can get a list of all of our current partners and how we're actually partnering with them, as well as links to their websites. So really, as Bill mentioned in the introduction, we're scientists, government agencies, nonprofit organizations, um, the tribes are getting involved, educators are very interested in this because they immediately see this as a way to connect people back to, back to nature, learners of all ages, everybody is learning about our natural world, and you, if you would like to participate in the phenology network. So, again, on the theme of getting organized, what's the goal of the network? Very, very simple. Just basically trying to understand how plants, animals, and landscapes, meaning the stuff, the writ broad out there, respond to environmental variation and climate change. When I say environmental variation, what I mean is there's other things that are changing uh, as you move across space, you know, as you go up to the top of the Appalachians, it's going to be different up there. How is that changing? Or through time, that climate change driver or other natural variation that happens just from year to year, how do we respond, understand, and adapt to that? So our mission, we have twofold mission. Our first part is to organize and distribute information to scientists, resource managers, and the public. Information about phenology. Now, I'm a plant ecologist. I'm a field biologist. I feel very comfortable counting acorns, planting them in the ground, counting the seedlings when they come up as part of the scientific process. And when I landed to be the executive director of this national network, I suddenly realized I was managing information. That was very scary to me. I was like, holy cow, I don't know, I don't know a bit from a bite. And uh, what's, a, what's a server, et cetera. But really, that's what we're all about, is organizing and managing information. So I have a very good team who helps me on that when we're collecting information and organizing it and using it, for example, to predict fires in the southwestern United States, or we're trying to understand how pollen is produced on junipers at the level of a whole stand of junipers, put it into a model, and figure out when that pollen goes up your nose so we can try to predict when pollen is going to be produced. Or if we're thinking about carbon balance and the start of the season, if we're trying to manage and understand carbon on a continental scale. But we have a secondary mission, too, and that is getting people involved. Because you know what? Phenology is relatively simple. We can all step outside and say, yeah, the leaves are on the red, red maples out there. Or, yes, I see a robin. Um, and so we can do a little bit of training. We can get people involved uh, uh, across a whole variety of groups of people who don't normally necessarily participate in science. So everybody has an opportunity to get involved. So we do this through our program called Nature's Notebook. It's a national plant and animal phenology observation program. It's kind of the technical term for it, but really it's just a way to get involved. We have a web app. We have mobile apps that you can get involved in tracking plant and animal uh, activity through our project, Nature's Notebook. And what are we doing then through Nature's Notebook? Well, we're tracking hundreds of plants and animal species, different kinds. We've actually got around 850 uh, uh, different kinds of plants or animals that can be tracked. Remember, this is a national program. And so as soon as we would get some uh, plant or animal added to the list and get the protocols developed and get it tied into the database, someone would come to us and say, well, we need, we need to get this uh, saguaro uh, onto the list, or we need to get uh, the little um, crepe myrtle or so. And so we've tried to be responsive as much as possible. We have a very nice list for the nation now. And we're engaging thousands of people, actually, by now we're scientists and citizen observers, citizen scientists working together on protocols and observing uh, thou uh, thousands of, of organisms. We've got around 16, let's see, uh, the last I checked, we had around 18,000 unique uh, organisms that were being observed through the system. So, and it's working out pretty well. Uh, this graph shows the changes in the number of people who are registered. The red line is uh, folks who have registered on this scale. As we got started, um, we started, we opened up the doors of the network in 2007, but we had to build this whole framework, this whole set of uh, protocols, the interface on, on the web, etc. And so data started rolling in in spring of 2009, started with plants and we expanded to animals. And so these are the observations recorded. 
Um, at the end of last year, we built this figure for the annual report. At the end of last year, we had about 750,000 observations at, on December 31st. And we realized in January, wow, we're going to hit a million observations. Let's, let's, that's great. A million records from people across the nation who are contributing to Nature's Notebook. And so on the 28th of April, I did a little screen cap capture of uh, something that we have on our website, a little counter, a little countdown. Uh, and there were 990,000 observations, and I didn't have a chance to get this updated, but we reached a million on Tuesday. A million observations now in the database, and we have a million six thousand now today. So the observations are just really pouring in. It's a very, very exciting time for for us. So, uh, so there are a lot of data that are rolling in and are being available. What I'd like to do now is just change the change the tenor just a little bit. Like I mentioned um, in 2009, when I came here, really it was mostly ideas. You know, the, the the framework for this. And yes, we did indeed have the plant program getting up and just getting rolling getting people involved and getting people excited. And so now, three years later, I can actually, I'm very happy to report that I can come back and put a different section in my talk. What are we finding? The patterns that we see across the, across the landscape from the Nature's Notebook uh, data collection effort. This is a graphic that was put together by one of our collaborators, Climate, Cent <coughs> Climate Central. And what they did is they took data from the lilac monitoring number, which actually goes back to about 1956. It was the only, is the best data set we have for phenology in the United States that's most continuous. We, inter we built it and integrated it into our contemporary observation system, Nature's Notebook. So the data you can get for the lilacs back to 1956 from our, from our system. And they basically, uh, we won't have time to go over this, but you can find uh, the uh, URL, uh, give me the URL, um, it's also in this, in this document. Where, there's, where they're documenting changes sort of on a state-by-state -state basis. And remember, we were talking a little bit earlier about, about Florida and how it hasn't shown uh, very much change. And, and sure enough, we don't, we don't see that. In fact, it's actually a day later there. It wasn't even on the scale here. Um, so there's a lot of variation. Spring is indeed coming earlier. Another thing that we're finding is those cherry blossoms. So we are working with a number of different partner organizations. One of those is Project Budburst that's run out of Boulder. They focus on just plant phenology. It's a very, very nice program, budburst.org. And some of the data that were collected through Budburst on cherry blossoms were used to create a model of cherry blossom peak bloom dates. And so what this figure shows by scientists in a paper that came out just last year in a very, very prestigious journal. What these scientists did is they said, okay, let's look at the pattern of blooming across this eastern uh, Atlantic, the mid-Atlantic here. Here's Washington, D.C., Richmond, and um, Baltimore up here. And they said, what are the patterns that we're seeing? And you can see here these colors represent the timing of, of peak bloom dates from the model, historical data. Uh, the average, uh, the peak bloom date for D.C. was between April 6th and April 10th. It's about, about right. That's actually what the Park Service has. And so that was very nice. But they used the the data from Project Budburst and other organizations to build a model to predict, well, let's, let's look at different climate change scenarios at different time periods. And so this is the time period 2010 to 2039, 2040 to 2069, so on averaging over time, and 2070 to 2099. So at the end of the next century, um, the models are predicting warming conditions, earlier flowering, we've seen that that happens, and that the flowering of cherry blossoms in the D.C. area will actually be, actually be earlier than March 5th. So you can imagine the National Cherry Blossom Festival, if they want to kind of keep up with that, they're struggling already, well, they'll have to think about moving that timing of the festival up each year. We've also uh, been very happy to have some colleagues at Princeton pull down the data from Nature's Notebook that have been collected on seven different deciduous tree species. And here I'll just show one. This is for red maple. What they did is they built a model that predicts when the red maple would flower and then basically set this as an average. And so this is anomaly. This is earlier in the year, later in the year, uh, from 1880 to 2000. So they used the, they reconstructed the, the leafing um, dates for red maple back into the past, took this as an average, and then said, let's use different emission scenarios. And when I say emission scenario, that means let's assume that Americans and the world continue to pump carbon dioxide into the atmosphere at a very high rate. That would be this emission scenario here. Or let's say we reduced our carbon consumption and um, put less carbon into the atmosphere and let it get soaked up back into the oceans and back into the, back into the forests at a rate that can be sustained. And that would be this scenario here. And what they found is that if we keep pumping carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it will indeed warm the earth 
in a way that will cause uh, maples to, to leaf out 15 days earlier by the, by the end of the upcoming century. In contrast, and this is actually kind of exciting, if we work together to reduce our carbon uh, production into the atmosphere, you can actually change that uh, and actually push the, t push the timing of, of leafing um, back to where it belongs. So there's great hope, and this is one very, very exciting uh, use of the data that people are collecting and contributing right now through Nature's Notebook. If there's anybody who's already participating, this is where some of your data are going and how we're, being, how we're using it. Here's another quick example of one of the things that we're finding when we use, when we're trying to understand the phenology, again, you're all familiar with that term, the phenology of invasive grasses. And this is the, this is the desert. This is just outside of Tucson. And these are wonderful saguaro cactus, a big part of our economy in Tucson relies on people coming to Tucson to see the saguaro flowers, the beautiful saguaro, saguaro desert system. But you know what? Deserts don't have grasses. They never evolutionarily had grasses. And you know what? Grasses burn. And so you end up with a system here where you have a very, very flammable, uh, invasive plant. This is buffalo grass introduced from South Africa. Um, it's actually introduced to a lot of places in the, around the world. Uh, but it's a real problem in this desert system. It does very well. Thank you. Everything yellow you see here is buffalo grass. And these green columns are the saguaros. And guess what? That buffalo grass burns and saguaros don't look very pretty when they're burning. So no one really, no one in Tucson wants to see this kind of thing on the, on the evening news. And the people who live in these multi-million dollar homes on the edge of town up in the foothills really don't want to see this on the front page of, say, the New York Times. Um, this is a big airplane, it's, uh, Hercules, that's dumping a retardant, retardant um, a fuel suppressor uh, and fire suppressor down behind these houses to prevent them from burning in a fire that was burning in the, in the area. So when we have very, very nice homes that are embedded in buffalo grass that was never there before, you have a problem and the mayor will wake up and take notice. So what do you do? Well, you can send the people out, to send, send the guys out to the field. It's actually uh, Arizona Department of Corrections, uh, trustees. I guess they're pretty trusty because they're giving them a Pulaski, which is a combination of a pick. Uh, it's, a, it's a pick and an ax. Ax on the front, a hole on the backside, and they send them up past the million dollar homes, around up into the canyons, the Pima Canyon, just outside of Tucson. It's actually where I've been tracking phenology. I figured if I'm the director of a national plant and animal observing system, I better partake in that as well. And I have been since 2010. And I've actually been tracking buffalo grass. I didn't know what would happen, but I'll show you a slide in a minute that shows you what we're, what we're doing. So you can send that, you send in the goons, you know, to pull out buffalo grass. Basically, they call it mechanical control. Uh, so what they do is they just go like this and they hack that buffalo grass out and they, they move it all around the slope and they're stuffing it into brown, black plastic bags and hauling it down off the mountain. Actually, they don't stuff it in black plastic bags, which is a bit of a problem because in some cases, some places they do, but these guys, what they would do is because they're up in the woods, they would basically just stack them into piles and put rocks on top of them. And what we were seeing is there's a problem. It appears that there's lots of seeds being spread around when they are doing that. Because they go up here and there's seeds on these grasses, but they weren't really paying attention to the seeds on the grasses. They were told, go do it. So, okay, we'll go do it. And they, as it turns out, um, there are seeds, and so you need to have the knowledge information about when the seeds are there. And through Nature's Notebook, we actually ask people to record when you see seeds on buffalo grass. I'll show you that data in just a second. Another alternative, though, is instead of going out and disturbing the plants very much, you can go out and spray it. And if you ever strapped a big black bladder bag on your back with straps that cut into your shoulders and you walk off a black basalt mountainside in the 110 degree heat in Tucson, spray an herbicide which has a blue dye in it so you know which plants you've sprayed because it's very, very soon. You're just wandering around like this thing. Where have you been? That's no fun whatsoever. They should send the Department of Corrections crew out here to do this. Why they would learn they'd be good kids from, from now on. Um, this is a lot, of, a lot of work. It's extremely expensive as you might understand. And the thing is, before that herbicide works, those of you who are using, they're using Roundup. It's like you round up, kill those weeds. You gotta spray it on a green plant. You gotta spray it on a green leaf, right? So you need to know the phenology information about the green leaves. So that's, again, we're tracking that true nature of notebook. And this is a very complicated figure, so I'm just gonna kinda give you the gist, the gist of it. So what I'm showing here is some of my very own data collected through nature's notebook. I started tracking buffalo grass out in Pima Canyon, the very same place where those guys are out going out, pulling up the grasses. And in, in March of, two, actually February of 2010, this is over here through October of 2011. 
And what I do is I go out every weekend. Actually, I just found out that I really loved going for a two-hour walk up into the mountains, beautiful mountainside. I'll show you another picture of that in a few minutes. And I go out quite regularly. And when I go out, every red mark here indicates the time when I saw seeds on the buffalo grass using Nature's Notebook. So there are very, very narrow windows. These red boxes indicate windows of opportunity for managing your buffalo grass if you're sending out your crew, so you're not spreading seeds around. Very narrow. The, the green line here is actually showing the amount of greenness in the canopy, sort of estimate of the greenness. And you can see there's a fair amount of variation through time. When we have our summer monsoons, our summer rains, that's when we get most of our rain. A little bit in the winter time, you get uh, pulses of green when you can go out and do your herbicide application. And so these bands, if you need 40% canopy green, and we still need to do some research on this, then you can go out only during these times of year to really get an effective kill. So again, we're collecting phenology information for a management problem that the mayor of Tucson and Jim Click Auto Motors Auto, uh, is very, very interested in because they depend upon people who come to Tucson. They want to keep people coming to Tucson. They don't want to burn up the world. They don't want to burn up the expensive homes. I'll just uh, try to try to wrap up here a little, a little bit. Tom, um, this is just a pattern of uh, of what we're seeing out here on the on the landscape of people who are monitoring red maple. And last week we got a call from a scientist who said, "Tell me where people are. Tell, can you tell me where people are seeing their red maple seeds? Because she wanted to do some genetic analysis. She lived down here in Athens, Georgia, and she wanted to do genetic analysis and she needed maple seeds." We said, sure, just go into Nature's Notebook, get the data for uh, when, what people are reporting for what they're seeing on maple seeds. So what I'd like to do is invite you to join us in this really exciting project and help uh, open the book of nature as we say. So we have all sorts of different organisms available for monitoring. You might be a fan of loons or uh, different kinds of hazelnuts or frogs or deer or whatever. This is what we see out there every day. And so we've developed a system that allows you to track any one of these organisms and their interactions with other organisms. If you go to usanpn.org, that's the home page of the, of the network. Click on the box here for Nature's Notebook. Get yourself logged in. It's a very simple process. Basically, you're going to search for plants and animals, learn how to observe, get yourself registered, and then start reporting on what you're seeing. And we use standardized protocols because we want people to be using the same protocol um, in Louisiana and in Maine and in Arizona if they're tracking uh, plants or animals. Um, this is being used by the Park Service in California. Nine, all 19 of the National Park Service units will be participating in Nature's Notebook. So, yes, you've got scientists, and you've got citizens, and you've got resource managers who are working together. So the first step, just a couple of steps here, choose your site. This is my site. I like to choose my sites carefully. I choose beautiful sites. This is uh, a riparian corridor, it's called, just outside of Tucson, about 15 minutes from where I live in downtown Tucson. This is a wilderness area managed by the Forest Service. Got saguaros, got Fremont cottonwoods. There are patches of buffalo grass there on the hillside, and this is the area. Um, it's not as invaded uh, as bad yet where I've been tracking my buffalo grass. And this is one of my very inauspicious organisms that I'm tracking. This is yes, this is is a buffalo grass. Um, it's senescent right now, which means the leaves have have gone dormant basically. But that's important. And if you look carefully, actually not very carefully, it's got covered with seeds. Um, so this would not be a good time to do mechanical control. The plant is still alive; it's just dormant. Um, and nor this would be a good time. Nor would this be a good time to spray with herbicide. It wouldn't do a thing. It'd be up in the spring again. Choose your organisms. Go out. Make your observations. So here we are down at Barataria Preserve at Jean Lafitte National Historic Park, and um, we're working with the Park Service, uh, introducing people to nature observations. Um, these are grad students who are taking in a program through the George Wright uh, Society of the Park Service. And we're out tracking red maple, just like the red maples that you have here. You can record any of your data. Again, the Park Service person, this is up at uh, Buster Harbor Islands, um, uh, where, where, where tr they're tracking uh, milkweeds um, here. You, this is this figure I created a little while ago, and I showed a picture of the data sheet that you can use to record information on grasses. But hey, now we've got two apps. We have a mobile app, a mobile apps for iPhone and Android applications, and you can download those from the iTunes uh, uh, store or the Android uh, market. And you can see a map and compare your data, and these are my, this is my location up Pima Canyon, so I park here past these nice million dollar homes, up here uh, to, to where I'm monitoring my buffalo grass in, in Pima Canyon. And this is just an example of what you can see. You can actually download your data, you can visualize your data, you can put it on a national map, and like this, 
and you can click on any one of those dots and see the data that are collected because by participating, you're agreeing to share your data with the database, but also share your data with the world. It's your information, but you're allowing other people to use it. That's how we work together in sort of a creative commons approach that allows scientists then to go in, like from Princeton, we didn't even know they were doing that, and they went in, they pulled down the data, and they sent them in, they worked with us to develop an attribution. And part of the attribution is thank you to all the people who are participating in Nature's Notebook. So we have many observers, many sites across just the lower 48. I couldn't fit Alaska on there. I'm from Alaska. Especially, what am I thinking? You can get partnered, partnered if you're an organization. You're like, oh, we are trying to engage people in the process of science or to get them more involved with nature or because we're worried about diabetes or we're, we're worried about uh, interurban violence and youth. Um, there's a number of different programs that we're working on. All of those programs that I just mentioned are, are, are working with us to get people involved in planting phenology gardens, doing urban restoration, getting the gardens going, tracking, tracking the plants and animals that they're seeing in, the, in those gardens that they plant. So this is a, uh, an example of one of our affiliate organizations, Science of the Seasons, in Maine. A number of different partners working together. They have about 100 observers across Maine who are partaking using our infrastructure, partaking in Nature's Notebook. Another example here, Wolf Ridge Environmental Learning Center, talking about phenology and weather observers. And you know, you're, you're talking to future voters here and you're getting them involved in this, in this process. And they have a bunch of different mobile apps, um, et cetera. So you can leverage on that natural, natural curiosity. Probably, I would guess by 10% of you in the room here have got some sort of phenology data set that you've been collecting on a pad of paper, or on the barn door, or in a shoebox, or you know, on the fridge. Um, and, and that's actually quite valuable information. Some of you actually probably have a really good data set that shows change through time uh, right there in your own backyard. And so we can leverage on And people want to know about that. You know, these guys want to know about it. Tom Ryan wants to know about it. Spring earlier, arriving earlier in Washington, D.C. So you can get started right there in your own backyard and partake in Nature's Notebook and be a part of the National Phenology Network. Thank you very much.